Welcome to Speaking from User Experience, powered by Crosscom. Once again, we have Darren Staten and Steve Maxson. Darren is our lead UX UI designer, passionate about solving problems through clean, minimal design. And Steve, our senior UX UI designer. And this actually happens to be his last day. When you're recording, when you're listening to this, it won't be his last day, but it is his last day today. So, but he believes that UX design has the power to influence lives and behaviors in significant ways. And that's why we had to get rid of him. He's no longer going to be a part of Crosscom. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding, of course. So um, today we got a really, really nice episode. Um, we're talking about designing for immersive experiences. Um, and by immersive, we mean augmented reality and virtual reality. And let's just get right into it. So. Just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, can we get a definition for virtual reality, which I think most people know, and then also get get a definition for augmented reality? Uh, well, I think in short terms, virtual reality is about immersion, right? Uh, it's usually done with a headset, something you put over to immerse yourself into a different world, right? You're trying to forget about the real world and, and experience this virtual world um, that you're in or environment. Uh, well, augmented reality is more of an extension of your reality, uh, so you're still looking into the real world, but you're enhancing it virtually uh, with, depending on the experience that you're going through uh, with visual assets and things like that. Yeah, I, I, I think you summed it up pretty good there. But the, the way the way I have to explain it like to like my, my mother-in-law, for instance, is that a, a virtual reality is best at taking a user and bringing them into a different world. It's one that's not necessarily fixed in reality uh, because like it, you're completely obscuring your vision. You're, it's, you can't see anything beyond the headset. Whereas augmented reality, whether it be through a headset, which is like stuff that's coming in the future, or today like on a, on a phone or a tablet, you're you're still looking at reality, but it's being augmented or adjusted in a way. So you're still grounded in a form of reality. Um, and typically, whether it, with the headsets that are you know starting to we're starting to see first looks at those, like you typically have like a transparent image that's overlaid on onto reality, or on like the iPad, right? It's using the camera and then it's painting something on top of the real world. And giving the impression impression that it's uh, it's there in in your real world, like you, you the I guess the bit, best example is like on Amazon and these other stores right now, where you can see objects, furniture, things like that, like in your yeah, in and, your space. Uh, I think a good way uh, to remember like AR like. is like it's like seeing through a window, right? You're looking through a window at um, the world, uh, where virtuality you're kind of taken over by the environment. Cool. Okay, so so virtual reality is um, replacing our our real world environment with a completely new reality. Augmented reality is augmenting our our reality with additional uh, visual information. Um, I think is what I'm hearing. So I think right. that's a I think that's a pretty good um, sort of way, um, definition to get us started. So let's talk about designing and designing for these immersive. Um, whether it's AR or VR. So what makes designing for immersive um, environments and spaces different than designing for 2D screens? Like, well, a, like a mobile phone or a, a computer screen or something like that. Well, I would say <laughs> there's a lot that's different. Um, but from a general perspective, right, 2D is different than uh, a 3D uh, perspective. And I think there's two two different things to consider when designing for AR and VR. Uh, like we talked about with AR, right? You're looking through a window. Uh, so you, you kind of need them to see reality. You need them to see the things around them. Uh, so your use of transparency, where you put things on the screen is different. And you're also using a combination of maybe 2D and 3D elements, right? Uh, seeing things out in the space, you could have 3D objects or 3D things that people need to navigate and move around where uh, you also may have 2D uh, designs and things that's on the screen. Um, well, in virtual reality, it's a, uh, it's, it's a lot different, right? There's a lot of cases there, but it's also about movement and the things that you're doing. So you're moving around inside the environment, uh, where in AR, you're moving around the object itself or the things in your, or just moving your hand and face. 
uh, uh, so it, it's there's a lot of differences uh, there, and there's also differences in like accessibility and safety uh, concerns, uh, which we can get into later. But I would say there's just quite a lot of difference. Yeah, I think I think you did a good job covering it. The the one thing that you touched on a little bit is you know, the, the designing in 2D, which is, you know, when we're working, um, you know, using, you know, I think we mentioned before, uh, we're big fans of uh, Figma, recently acquired by Adobe for $20 billion with a B. Um, you know, we're, we're a big fan of that. And when we're working with that program, we're always doing it on a monitor. Um, so you're always, you're always looking at things in a, in a 2D space. And, and so like you're, you're, as you're designing, you're also previewing what the end experience is going to be. And, you know, obviously you, you know, we're always zooming in and out. And so there's always things with like, you know, designing for scale and things like that, where, where it gets really tricky with AR and VR is you're designing for an experience that's taking place in a 3D space. And you, that is hard to replicate on a on a 2d system because you have to take into account how far objects are from the user whereas on a 2d display we always know i mean we, we don't always necessarily know what device you're using and so that's where you know we have to deal with like things like responsive design on uh on for when we're designing like websites in particular uh but you know that can also go for apps too that need to support you know phone and tablets uh, but yeah, yeah, VR though and AR, they introduce a whole new level of complexity that we had to uh, come to understand and come to find systems that, that account for that. And it also requires us to, it's, it's far more critical to get to a prototyping stage when you're doing AR or VR than it is in doing something 2D. So that way you can actually experience it uh, in a manner that the user is going to, because like I, like I said before, it's very easy to do that. You're doing that as you design in when you're designing for a 2d interface and 3d you're not. And so like you could, if you go all out and design everything, um, in your, your, your design program, whether it be Figma, um, XD or sketch or whatever you're using, then you might spend all this time and then you, you, you put, then you, send over development and then you put the headset on and you're like, Oh, you know, like the, how, how far the objects are, the scale, the font size, it's all off. And, and because like, I didn't account for where I was going to be in the 3d space and where that object was going to be in the 3d space and how easy it is to see. So that, that to me is like, that was the biggest obstacle when I first started designing. Yeah. yeah. For, I agree oh, with Steve. VR. I was going to say, I agree with Steve there, especially with the, uh testing and trying as early as can as you can uh, i really say especially when designing for AR and vr you want to treat your initial ideas and designs that are on the 2d uh surface as uh sketches and uh, i think uh one thing which is funny i don't quote steve very often uh but i would say in, in this case i think something powerful that steve said right was like you design 2d things in a 2d space so you should design 3D things in the 3D space, and like uh, just that that mind that small little uh, uh, sentence there is like powerful because it, it's true. Like you can see what you're when you're designing in 2D, you're, you're some creating something 2D. You see the final result; it's right in front of you. But if you're trying to create a something 3D uh, in a 2D software, then you're not seeing the final product. You don't you don't see how it moves, and but you're getting the accessibility and like you said, size and seeing things and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I, I have a feeling we're gonna we're gonna touch more on some of these these um, these ideas with some of the other questions. But I, I do want to ask, since we're talking about virtual reality and augmented reality, and we were kind of doing like the difference between immersive and two D screens. Now let's go a little deeper. You know, what maybe differences do we have to consider between augmented reality and virtual reality when designing? Because there we we often just throw them together, AR VR. Um, we do it all the time, um, even in marketing, when we're talking about our services, we'll say AR, VR, AR, VR, AR, AR, VR, but they're not the same thing. So how, 
you know, how might you design for one versus the other or, or approach the, that? <laughs> so, so it's a lot to unpack uh, when you talk about that. But if we're talking about, I would start with virtual reality, right? Uh, when you're designing for that, there's a lot to consider. For one, when you think about how you move in virtual reality and how you're viewing, uh, when virtual reality first started, it was uh, this thing called three degrees of freedom. So it just means you can rotate your head left to right. Um, and you can also uh, kind of move it up and down, right? But the idea is you're just using your head uh, to view your environment. Um, and later on, you know, we developed six degrees of freedom, uh, which started adding the idea of movement into it, right? I can walk forward, I can move back. I can move, I can like adjust my body up and I can adjust my body down to duck and things like that. Uh, so with that being said, you know, you have to consider that movement which is something you don't have to uh, consider uh, when you're doing regular design, right? So it, it's a lot more to think about um, because there's different experiences. Uh, I think Beat Saber is a, 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 a great example where everything that's happening in that game is happening in front of you. You're only, you're only seeing like 180 uh, degrees of uh, graphics, right? Um, and most people think when you're in VR that everything's happening all the way around. You can turn around, you can move, there's something coming at you from all directions. Um, and when designing, the thing is you don't have to do that. So that means there's a lot of uh, decision making. Uh, things are optional. It gives you a lot of room to play around, but it also means there's things to consider. Uh, you have to think about your user, uh, like most things, but I would say even more because you have to think about safety. Safety is a huge uh, thing in both, but uh in virtual reality right you can't see your environment you can't see your real world so being aware of uh the experiences you're creating and how people are going to be using them if they're jumping if they may have if they think they have to run and next thing you know they ran into their tv we've all seen like little things on tiktok or something where people are playing a boxing game and they just totally went uh ko their uh laptop or a 60 inch tv uh so you want to be careful for that myself included i've been, uh, in fact, it was Beat Saber. I was playing Beat Saber. Uh, one of the walls are coming at me. I forgot that this is a game, and I went to jump and clothesline myself uh, <laughs> because you know my headset uh, uh, had uh, was tethered because I was charging it. So th there's a lot of things <laughs> you want to consider uh, that can put people in uh, danger. There, uh, locomotion is the idea of movement. So you're moving uh, with your controller. Is how people. It's kind of like teleporting. Uh, how you teleport during the game, right? Uh, if you don't design that correctly, people get motion sick. Uh, I think you've heard it before. Uh, if you in your VR too long, when you're moving, people are not used to it. Because uh, in the real world, you're walking, right? Your mechanics know that you're moving. But uh, in most cases, you're standing still or sitting. And when you're moving, uh, sometimes too fast, right? If it's not designed to have the right speed and calibration, uh, people can get nauseous and sick. Uh, so just the, even to the idea of how people operate and move within VR has to be carefully designed. So I don't want to take all of the talking rooms because there's so many things to unpack, but those are just a few things. And I let Steve kind of add some stuff to you. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I, I know our fearless leader, Don, also um, believes in is when you're talking about AR and VR, I really think that the conversation needs to expand because I think there's there's VR and then there's there's AR through a headset and then there's AR through a tablet or uh, through a device, tablet or phone, um, because there's there's a big big difference mm -hmm. I think between all three of those. Uh, but it's important to clarify on the AR side, and that that's very important to. to understand from the beginning because i know sometimes i've been i fall in uh victim to assuming when someone's talking about ar they're talking about like the the hollow lens or magic leap which are both headsets that you wear so similar to like a vr headset or hmd uh head mounted display um and so I, I, that's where my brain always goes to because that's what i feel is the future uh Dar darren knows uh, we've talked about this a lot but i'm kind of <laughs> I guess like I'm an AR snob kind of like, you know how, you know, when you watch like cooking shows, like they have like those chefs and they're like, I've never eaten like, like junk yeah. food or I've never had like Campbell's soup or something <laughs> like that. It's like, one, who are you? Are you an alien or something like that? But two, like, you know, they, they're very snobby. I feel that way about like AR and a tablet and a phone where I just feel like 
it's it's something it's a necessary step in order to get development experience and get people thinking about the technology but i believe in the next i think sooner than we expect i think in the next five years it's going to be obsolete that those things are no longer going to exist or at least most of them i think there might be some circumstances where it will continue to linger around where it's convenient for the user to have it so things like you know scanning um using your your phone to scan like like a plant or something like that to identify what type of plant it is and get information on that. There might be some AR stuff there that still makes sense where you don't necessarily need a wearable um, or you know, contact lenses with AR built in and things like that. But anyway, like that, it's important to distinguish between between those things. And otherwise, I think like when you when you're thinking about it, I think with VR you have to deal a lot more with like locomotion. Uh, concerns like what Darren had talked about in in the first step, um, how to make sure you don't get the user sick. That's like a, a real thing. Sick or fatigued um, with like using their arms too much um, uh, uh, potentially, um, right? which I that also would go into like AR from like a the, the head mounted display perspective. But yes. otherwise, I think AR you have to think a lot more about safety. Um, because you're usually wearing these things in a more social environment, um, more of an open space. And that's not to say that VR can't be that, but more often than not, you're um, alone or you're like you're in a more controlled environment in most circumstances, most but not all circumstances. But I think that's like the biggest thing is just like thinking about uh, really taking, you need to really always take a user-centric approach and understanding the environment that the user is going to be using it in and making the design decisions knowing that if they're going to be seated then they're not going to be able to move their head all the way around that goes for ar and vr um and then and then like just again like if what type of environment are they in? are there other people around mm -hmm. are there obstacles can they get hit by a bus you know like things like that that's all very important and um i think that you know a lot of those safety issues i think are going to affect ar more and more than outside of than, than yeah VR. and it's funny actually i want to unpack that environment thing a bit more i would say uh even sitting here thinking about it uh i think if you're really concerned thinking about the differences when designing uh it's not even really the visuals right uh which there's a lot to unpack there but um i think environment is really what makes a huge huge difference uh especially for hr i mean hr, HR. <laughs> 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 obviously i have other things on my mind uh ar uh sorry for ar um is the environment uh because i think steve touched on it a little but there are like multiple spaces right when designing for ar to think about you have your intimate space which are things like really close up to you uh i think good examples of intimate space AR right now which if depending on who you ask like steve it may not be good examples but it's like Snapchat filters or Instagram filters, right? If you hold your phone up and you can put a mustache on like Philippe or something like that. Uh, I think that that is more intimate space. And then you got personal space, you know, putting things on your on your desk. Uh, maybe there's a big replica of like a 3D house so you can view it and things like that. That, that You got that there. You have social space. Um, your living room or places you're uh, walking around in, right, immediately, but maybe three or four or five people may be involved with that. Um, and then you got public space. These are things like uh, Google Maps, right? Has AR features that point and show directions. The reason all that's important because this is just a significant uh, increase depending on what space you're in when you're using AR uh, of danger, right? And in your home, in that intimate space, it might not be as much, right? But then once you move to personal or maybe social space, then you have to deal with objects in your home or people uh, um, hitting windows, right? Uh, if you're in a public space, people are running in the doors or like Steve drastically said, getting hit by a bus uh, are all things that can happen drastically uh, depending on when you're using AR. Uh, with VR, you're mostly right now, the average consumer is in one place um, and they may move around their home and things like that. But no one is using VR uh, outside near a bus station, uh, at least currently. That is not something that's happening, you know, unless it's. I don't advise people to do it. Let's not say there's no no one doing it, but but but, but people are using it on like you know yeah. on the train in Japan. Uh, public transportation is a lot bigger. Like 
<laughs> you keep that headset. You get off the train. You keep your headset. I on. do not advise. Yeah, that. I think this is. I think well, this is a really I, I do not advise topic, that topic though, because um, for the record, one would think, you know, when you think of safety, you think, well, virtual reality. You're completely not seeing anything. There's more opportunity to, um, to get into trouble. But you're right. Like you're you're probably you're more than likely using it in some sort of a controlled environment. And if you're doing it responsibly, you've you've you know created space for yourself in that environment to to safely do VR. Yeah. Um. Often augmented reality is is intended to uh, help us do an uh, uh an activity that we're already planning on doing often out in the world, especially where augmented reality is going. Right. This assist this idea of assistive uh ar right so now yeah you you're you're getting all this new information think about like the billboards that already exist in the real world and now you're creating for lack of better word more billboards mm -hmm. right more information that you have to process there's things like cognitive load and that's just one thing but then there's also the physical safety so i think that's a really really good point yeah Yeah, and I, I saw I saw a cool um, demo of uh, of AR where someone's uh, working on a skyscraper, and I think they were doing electrical work or duct work or something like that. And they scan a QR code on their phone, and then the QR code loads up, um, you know, the this application, and then they're able to point the phone around and see where all the duct work and stuff is going to be laid out. Now, imagine you're doing doing this work on like the like the hundredth floor of a skyscraper, right? And and you don't want to obscure things that could cause the user to fall, um, yeah. so like that that's a case right there where you got to be be careful. Like it's it's really cool, powerful technology. Yeah. And that's funny when uh, Steve talks about like a uh, obscuring right uh, with uh, with AR and things like that. That's a good point. Like not blocking the user's sight is a big part. Uh, transparency, which Steve talked about earlier, um, but ha the the way that you lay out things on the screen. I think uh, are even more important. Not that there's not important things in VR, but I think if we're talking about AR, right, uh, allowing space for people to see things around them is uh, really, really important because I think the basic thing to remember is, is extension. Uh, this is supposed to be helping you with your everyday reality, uh, not replacing it. Uh, so you, you really have to be careful there. Uh, and we've seen that uh, even with games, right? Pokemon Go, people were getting hit by cars or walking into ditches. Um, finding yourself in the middle of a swamp because they're trying to get um, some Pokemon. And, you know, kids are not thinking. And next thing you know, they're drowning. So you really want to be very kids, careful. what about Steve? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, man, I had to get Pikachu. I had to get him. Yeah. Not my and, fault. And that a lot comes jungle. up there, like ethics and Niantic's everything. Fault. So I would say the normal stuff that you deal with from every day to day, print design, and then... Um, uh, not even just print, but uh, uh, digital design and mobile design, all of that is incorporated into AR, uh, which, is, which is a lot, right? Um, where I think VR gives you a little bit more room to play around, but it's more about internal harm. It's more about making people sick or uh, just uh, knocking into things around them immediately uh, is more your concern when it comes to safety with that. And I think gives you more uh, creativity uh, wise when it comes to VR than it does AR. Yeah, one thing I've heard Don talk about is like with augmented reality, another consideration is because you are tacking on visual assets to to the real world, which is, you know, pristine fidelity because it's the real world. Mm -hmm. You now have to like consider if you want to be able to keep the illusion alive that one, it, it needs to um, seamlessly you know, if you want, for example, to replace a um, the modern view of a cityscape with what it looked like 50 years ago, for example, you need to be able to sort of seamlessly make that illusion happen and have your your the quality of your um, of your uh, not animation, but your your illustration or your visualization be um, as pristine as possible to to. To, to make the illusion that much more realistic. And so that's something that you don't have to really think about in virtual reality. Obviously you want, you know, you often want to have realistic simulations. No, I think it's the opposite. No, what I'm saying is you're not, you're not having to match 
you're not having to match reality, right? You're, uh, you can, so for example, like we play mm -hmm. that mini golf game, you know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be pristine quality in terms of, it does, you know, you have the, um, so we're talking about visually, right? The idea of versus like photorealism versus photorealism. like cartoon or stuff exactly. like that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not that you can't have it in AR space, but oftentimes you're trying to, you know, uh, make it live alongside reality. Um, and when you do that, you may want to uh, make sure that your quality is, is therefore as close to matching reality as possible. I don't know how I feel about that statement. I would say 50-50, because I can see some things around here, and I, I'm curious what Steve thinks on this. Uh, but one, let me touch on VR, because that's the easiest one. Uh, I actually, and this is my opinion, I think staying away from photo uh, realism in virtual reality will make the user experience better uh, than uh, trying to go for that photo photorealism. Uh, in virtual you, reality, in virtual reality, right? I because you that. you will get to those things like the uncanny valley and things like that. Uh, and I believe immersion doesn't necessarily have to deal with photorealism. It's more that you're buying into the uh, the the environment that you're into, right? And you can get that even a small of immersion by doing everyday things like video games, right? Like Mario Kart. If I'm playing Mario Kart long enough and you're with the right people in the right environment, you will forget that you're doing anything else for that moment. You're really just into the game. You're like, I'm in this game. Sure. Um, so I think that can happen. So when it comes to follow realism, I think that's actually more to your benefit to stay away because your eyes know when something's off, right? And since we're in reality every day and so used to it and we've built these mechanics, if something looks different and weird, then you're going to be like, okay, this is off. Uh, but I also say is, yeah, it should not, it doesn't have to look like it, but it should mimic. Uh, and what I mean by that, this is things like affordances and signifiers, right? If you open a door, the same way you expect to grab or pick up stuff in real life, you want to do that in virtual reality. You don't want to get rid of the mechanics or uh, habits that people built up in the real world because that will lose immersion. Uh, so I say it, there's a there's a fine line there for VR. But with AR, I'm not sure you want to replicate uh, as far visual quality because the thing is i think from a safety concern i would want to know the difference between what's real and then what's the extension of my reality I, I don't know if i don't know if okay so so this is another situation where we're talking about scenario and so let me give you an example okay we we um built a uh ar exposure therapy app we were working with researchers um and we built an ar exposure therapy app which introduces feared objects, so consider spiders, into a person's real world space. Now, the more realistic that spider is, the more effective it is as treatment, right? So there are, mm -hmm. there are situations often where you're, because this thing is, is being introduced to reality and is, is made to look like a part of reality, that you, you want that realism. Now, I do get what you're saying. Um, it's certainly like if I'm walking uh, 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 um, in a cityscape, for example, I I may want the, in, like, you know, Google Maps, I want the arrow to be obvious, right? But yeah. it should still, it should still feel seamless with the Yeah, the it should be world. seamless, but you yeah. shouldn't, you shouldn't look at the road sign in real life and then look at the uh, UI sign and be like, huh. And not I, even realize that it's augmented. Am right? I keeping I agree straight or turning left? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't I, know. I agree happening. with that. I agree with that. Yeah. That makes sense, Steve. What are your thoughts there? I like I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ride the fence on this one. I think because I think it really depends. Like I don't want to make a blanket statement because I really think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. like we think of like augmented reality, like you can think of like normally, like and I, I do this too, but I, I typically think of it as like a a way to enhance uh, people's lives, like a, like a, almost like a tool to help them along of like you know if you think of it like you know integrating it with like google maps or something like that and then like as you look around you know i'm thinking like like you have like like glasses right smart glasses or something like that as you look around like you're in a downtown area like you see the reviews of every store you look at just by looking at the sign right and then um or maybe you look off in the distance or something like that and you're like okay but you, you want pizza a really good pizza joint is right around the corner uh just go straight here and then hang a left right 
like so that that's like one thing right that's like that's like an experience but what happens like you might there are ar games out there for an mm-hmm. ar game you might want to try to achieve realism in order where you want the ui elements to bleed in as seamlessly as possible with the real world um you might want to do that so like i think that there's uh, like uh I think there's a give and take. I think it's all up to what you're trying to achieve. What are your goals with whatever piece of software, game, whatever it might be you're trying to achieve. And I think that holds true for both AR and VR. I I, I think like you can have the more, like you can, like, like we talk about like walkabout golf, right? For something that's not, it's not aiming for realism, right? And, mm-hmm. and that's like a big thing too uh, with whether we're talking about VR or or AR with these tetherless uh headsets like the Quest 2 uh the the ma- the well, well like well, I guess like yeah, the the HoloLens the Magic Leap um like you know they they all have like very low processing power they're they're cool. it, they're they're weaker than uh like the I- iPads that are out there and um to, just to keep the like well at least for like the rift too right to keep it consumer friendly within like that well it was three hundred dollars now it's four hundred dollars but still within like it's consumer friendly so like they can't do like grand visuals but then like that's where it gets interesting though because we see the psvr2 is coming out at the beginning of 2023 and that that is going to be probably i think that's going to be the last tethered headset that we see released the vr headset that we see released but that thing's connected directly to a ps5 and is going to be able it's going to be able to put out much higher fidelity graphics than you can see on the quest 2 right now now i know quest meta and quest they have their own thing going on they have a, a new headset coming out as well that isn't supposed to be quite as powerful and then there's another one planned sometime in 2023 or 2024 yeah it's like a pro um, version yeah yeah, the pro version is the one that's coming out soon. They haven't announced yeah. the release date yet, unless something happened today that I didn't see. But, um, but either way, like the, the, going back to like video games, though, is like, and, and like where that goes with like you know realism or like I- immersion, like we've seen it right from think back where like the the NES to the SNES to the what the N N sixty four or the, I guess yeah get GameCube or Game N sixty four GameCube. And then, well, I guess like then, like then, like PlayStation, and Xbox, those guys took over. But each console generation is achieving higher fidelity graphics, and people mm-hmm. are buying it more than ever. So people are looking. I think that's proof that people are looking for that immersion, those realistic graphics. Um, and I think so. That I think that's like that's where I would point to is like there's proof of that concept, and I think that would apply to both spaces, AR and VR. Sorry, yeah. that was another one of my. No, you're fine. I would say, I think, just to sum up both of us, I think I agree with Steve, there's a time and place. Uh, and I think, and that's why I don't want to, I agree with him, put a blanket statement, but a lot of it goes back to designing and that's part of your job to understand uh, when and where to use things uh, because all those will have different uh, precautions and uh, requirements uh, and levels of safety. Uh, like you said, you know, the thing you gave the example with the spiders, that's in a controlled environment. Um, there's people watching it. So if they freak out, they're not about to run into like an object and impale themselves, right? Um, but in this case, you want that high fidelity, um, especially in a lot of research. You you want that uh, kind of realism there so you can reenact it without having to like actually pour a bunch of spiders on this uh, uh, woman or man. You know, you don't want to do that. Uh, this, this is simpler or must say, um, I think there's a case too they're doing with like testing with athletes, right? With them or have traumatic experiences or like they have an injury. I think we heard this from one of our coworkers, like they have an injury uh, that only happens in the game because they're going harder, right? At a different level of intensity that they can't replicate in practice. So having them in a VR headset trying to reenact that, uh, that shot that they're taking or them playing defense, you still might want those high quality uh, things, right? But I think there's cases where commercially at your house, you may not want uh, a super realistic uh, military experience uh, or you will have a lot of people having PTSD uh, uh, at home in their living room. So I think there's just, just cases for different things. And I think you just got to be aware of what you're doing. For sure. And the one thing I'll say about augmented reality is I agree, like, you know, depending on the use case might determine how 
um, photo realistic you want to go. And um, so maybe I'll amend what I said earlier. But I think one thing is true is that how well the technology, um, you know, how well you're able to anchor um, your whatever you create to the real world becomes very important, right? Mm -hmm. um, for that illusion. So again, using the spiders, part of what makes it effective is it sees the, the, the app sees the world through and through the cameras of the HoloLens and and then the spiders are you're able to um the, the you're able to you know see see the walls and and all that stuff and the spiders are able to then appear as if they're crawling on the surfaces of the room right and so being able to anchor um elements to the real world whether they are you know high fidelity or 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 low fidelity i think is is part of the magic in of augmented reality and what makes it um makes it, what what makes it so fascinating at least in my opinion yeah but just to clarify i am ready for a ready player one type uh universe or metaverse you know i i'm fully committed to having a life inside vr as well oh, as my real life so uh, i'm not against some things like super realistic but i'm just saying <laughs> i don't know if i i don't know if i'm ready for that level of like like full immersion for like where you completely like lose yourself kind of thing. Oh. But it's funny because like um I had, <laughs> I think this is fine to say. I had to to tell Don gave a talk in which he was talking about like a day in the life of a, a virtual reality. He was talking he was talking about all of the different things that you could do in virtual reality. And I think that the audience, some of not the whole, whole audience, a couple of members thought that what he was saying was that he was suggesting that people spend their entire day in virtual reality. <laughs> what he was actually saying was look at all the ways that immersive a virtual or augmented reality could be a part of someone's day. Yeah. Not that a person should spend their entire <laughs> I wouldn't assume my time, entire but apparently day. apparently Darren is 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 on his way there. Not my entire day, but like cuz I probably wouldn't work in a, a VR and things like that. Although a lot of UX design I think in the future will involve you having a headset on a lot of the time, right? Or things like yeah. that. So it probably will be part of my everyday uh, lifestyle. But, you know, playing board games with the friends and doing That's things fair. like that, or, you know, it's raining, but you still want to go out and club a little, do some partying, throw in my headset, put on my dinosaur avatar, and I get going, you know? So <laughs> those are the things like that. Yeah, and well, there it, are... it's great. Those things already exist too, because yeah, you've got Tabletop that. Simulator, which <laughs> yeah. has VR built in. You can actually play board games with others. And then, um, what, you got the VR chat is probably what you're looking for. Yeah, it's just like the... RuneScape, right? Oh, World of Warcraft, like these things, if you just took RuneScape and made it like, you know, virtual reality, then that's what you have. You have people just spending days in here conversating with other people, doing things, playing games, same thing. And, and, what's, and this is actually probably a really good segue because um, one of the questions I had was, what can we expect for, for the future of these technologies? Um, and it's funny that you say that because... Yeah, like we know that you know Facebook, especially is is look you know with Facebook was it Horizon, um, is looking and 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 really everybody we we've heard heard this buzzword the metaverse being used a lot, but this idea of these social spaces where people can be a part of, um, and you know like like Steve said, there's already there are already examples of people being able to join a shared space and mm -hmm. you know listen to music or party or chat or you know whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's examples everywhere. I mean, you have people doing concerts now in Roblox, you know, or Fortnite, and uh, people are going on Fortnite just to watch concerts. So I, I think it's already a thing. Uh, and I think uh, as people get into VR and AR, uh, I think the terms VR, VR and AR may change over time. You know, there's been talks about like things like mixed reality and uh, stuff like that. The idea of that, you know, uh, it may be ingrained or in, ingrained in other things, right? There's different ways of using cameras and visual technology. I mean, especially for like AR, right? People are working on contacts, but who's to say in the future that might blend with VR uh, with the way that contacts, you know, may interact with your peoples and things like that. Uh, you got glasses is uh, I think the uh, most uh, recent and probably uh, it's gonna be the first thing that people will adopt this idea of using like shades and glasses uh, for AR and things like that. And, uh, over time, as we've seen with like cell phones and devices, things will get smaller. So what is now headsets for the VR uh, just might 
these simple uh like smaller little lenses that go over your eyes you know you don't know uh but the, the point is I, I do think the future has uh, a lot of good things coming so yeah I think yeah what do you think about the sort of the the future um and these technologies steve and darren touched on it there but there's this company out in california called mojo lens that has uh, a prototype out there of a contact lens that uh, it puts a, I think it's a 256 by 256 image o directly over your retina um, in order to, uh, and, and, and it's an augmented reality platform then. And so it has the battery, it has the processing all built into this contact lens and it's supposedly comfortable for about two to three hours. So I think when I tell people that, like they're kind of shocked at, that that, that 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 technology isn't that far off mm -hmm. and if you yep. like i i'm, I'm big I, I always like i'm always interested in, in watching movies that like science fiction movies that deal with like ar because i know like the big one that everyone talks about is minority report with with tom cruise and you know how he's like you know when he's trying to solve crime crimes and stuff he's moving stuff around with his hands he's throwing screens over to the side and stuff like that we know now that's not realistic. We talked about it before, like arm fatigue and stuff. Like that's not how it's going to work. But like there was a, a movie that came out in 2021, I believe it was on. But on I want Apple. it to work that way. <laughs> what? I what? want you it want to, to work like that. Well, you're gonna get tired. I want, I want your arm, this. you're gonna be ripped, Philippe. You're gonna be. Well, that's ripped. what I need. That's yeah, what I need. Yeah, you do that. Yeah, all that <laughs> stuff like constantly, and you know, all your si solving future crimes that haven't yet been committed. <laughs> Why would you do that, Philippe? They didn't even do anything wrong yet. But <laughs> anyway, there's this, there's a movie. It's on Apple Apple TV Plus, whatever that Apple Plus thing is. It's called Swan Song. And it, it's a pretty good movie, but they have it, it takes place. And I think, it, I, in my opinion, I could be wrong here. I'm speculating. But because it's, like, it's an Apple TV exclusive show, I think they actually had insight into what Apple might be thinking. Um, maybe I'm not saying they're planning this necessarily, but I bet you they probably talked to someone at Apple about what they might be thinking, what AR could be like. And so you can see different interfaces that they have and how, how they interact with it in the world. And I think that's really fascinating. And they, and they also, it went through the contact method, uh, where he, you can see he, he takes out the contacts in the show and they show like the, the display on there and everything like that. Now those contacts, I, I mentioned before, the image is like 256 by 256. That's tiny. That's uh, that's 256 pixels compared to like a 4K TV has uh, like what 4,000 lines of horizontal resolution. Narrow that down to 256. Like your your image quality of uh, on that is going to be, you're not going to be able to do very much with it. But it's a proof of concept. It's it's an early prototype, and that's going to get better and better. And also, too, this screen is on the size of a grain of sand. That's how yeah. small it is. It's and, crazy. And I know right now we're talking probably about, I would say, 10, 15, maybe 20 years out. But even far closer than that, like super near future, uh, Steve has touched on it too uh, with the contacts. But the idea of having visuals that appear uh, and adapt to where your eyes are looking is something that's already here, right? There's something uh, PS, uh, PlayStation VR 2 uh, has it. Um, and there's higher end um, headsets that already exist now. Uh, where it has a bunch of uh, uh, pixels and stuff that condense uh, wherever you're looking and things like that in the headset, uh, uh, which I don't know the full science behind that, and you would need like our, our supreme leader Don uh, to break that down for you. But um, the, the the point is like a lot of that technology is here. Um, it's just super expensive, and I think that's something to, to account for in the near future too. Is prices going down as things become more uh, commonplace? You know, the more people use VR, AR, and it replaces certain little aspects, you know. Uh, I think, to me, what will make a game changer is uh, it becoming more prevalent within, like, gaming, right? It's, it's, it's kind of getting there, but I think once uh, you can, like, when you think, uh, like, playful and fun, you think Nintendo, right? You're going to automatically play your game. Or if you're like, oh, games, you're thinking PC or this. You We have to get to a point where I think, VRs in that space or AR and, and a lot of people have headsets at home, right? Like everyone had the Wii at one point. It was like a common thing to have in your house. So I think once we get to that point, people are, are going to be more open to technology. Same with glasses, you know, glasses everywhere and everyone has like 
you know, what is today's little kind of modern version of AR, um, right? Even though it may not be full what it could be yet, I think just having that technology and people used to it and the price is going down, people used to paying for it. Uh, I think over time, I mean, shoot, the PlayStation stuff is like 800 bucks, right? Uh, and I, I think their VR2 may be around that price. So so people are like, people are used to shelling out like a thousand bucks, 800 bucks or 300 bucks or 400 bucks for like Oculus and stuff uh, or Meta. So I think, uh, I just think as prices adjust uh, and the technology becomes more uh, accessible, then I think the limits are, it's, everything's limitless from that point. And I, I think the, the quest is in like the, Four hundred dollar area, isn't it? Yeah, but that, that's, yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the thing where I. Where I that's why I made a face though. It's like they just raised the price a hundred dollars because, well, it's affordable like, though. It, yeah, 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 and, and but also too, like that's that going back to like twenty sixteen, like the you know the quest. I think the the original like Oculus Rift, the the first consumer grade one, not like the the dev uh, dev kit version. I think it when it first came out, I think it was like a thousand or eight hundred dollars or something like that. And then in summer of 2016, they slashed the price for like three or four months or something like that. Um, or they said it was going to be for three or four months and they slashed it down to $300. And mm-hmm. that's when it really took off. And then that's when like they realized, all right, our price point is that, you know, that three to $400 mark. Because after that, after that three months was up, they decided, no, we're keeping the price like that because like, that's how we become the industry leader. So that's why like, yeah. When you say like the P, I didn't know this about the PSVR being like two being eight hundred dollars. I think that's like an outrageous price to pay for. Well, people are like guessing they're going to be that price only because the I think the PlayStation, the first PlayStation, uh, I think four or so, uh, I think was around like five six hundred bucks, right? Uh, and then when the VR headset came out, it matched the price. It was the exact same price as the system. So if the PS five is eight hundred bucks. Then you can assume that the the headset is either going to match the price or be slightly lower. Uh, I don't think they're drastically going to give you a new headset for three hundred bucks, especially when it comes with ten times more technology than the first. Um, so, but the thing is, a lot of this stuff is becoming more accessible, and I think you got to give like Apple a big to that, right? They're they're, they're that high end approach and having different options. I think is where we're going to get to. It. That's what I'm saying. Come in, come in place. I can imagine when we get to a point with Oculus or other companies, or I think Meta now, as we call them, uh, but where you have a consumer base level, $300, $400 headset. You have a pro level, $800, $900 headset. And then you have like super pro, whatever name they're going to to give to it. Uh, For those who are like those, I want to be on the cutting edge of technology. And when you get to where average consumers are buying into one of those sections, normally, I think that's that's the future. I think that's where we're trying to get to currently. Yeah, and so we'll uh, I, we'll end on that note. I will say um, to your point though, Darren. Um, I, every now and then, as you know, when I'm in, in my Oculus, I see a new a new Facebook friend who who has gotten an Oculus as well. And I'm and every now and then you'll see more you know people coming in. And I think you're right. And you mentioned Apple. Every you know we know that. That Apple's working on, um, some say it's a, 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 you know, a mixed reality head-mounted display. Some say they're working on the, you know, actual glasses. Um, I'm sure they're probably working on both. But um, yeah, I think that y- you mentioned Apple being one of those companies that when they do it, then it becomes mainstream, right? And so yep. next year, next year, if you believe the rumors. Yeah, you got yeah. Walmart. Shoot, Walmart's starting to adopt AR technology now. Uh, uh, women can try on um, different clothing and stuff like that. Uh, um, you know, from the dressing room, Steve's tried it as well. Uh, yeah. You know, tried on a few dresses. Do you have pictures. Yep. I, 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 I should <laughs> probably uh, make those available. But um, when a but Walmart, yeah. Target, and places like that, I, when people start adopting it more, I think yeah, that's the goal. I, I do. So it, I would like to say that I do not agree with how Darren connected Apple and Walmart. There, <laughs> <laughs> they're both major companies that influence everyday life. Yeah, Walmart ain't exactly influencing technology too much, though. <laughs> but it is. It is. There's nothing more mainstream than Walmart, though. Yeah, that's so, true. Like, but uh, yeah, I agree to the fact that like, like, whoa, whoa. sorry, oh. I got a scam likely call. 
Oh yeah. See, look, this is our host here, everyone. This is our host. <laughs> yeah, like, get, taking calls here, you know, recording. <laughs> Um, but I, I do agree, though, that like Walmart, like them getting into this and, and utilizing it, it, you know, I, I, you know, like when they, when they, the, the announcement came out on September 15th, I believe, I bet you that September 16th, well, and that might have been a Saturday, but the, whatever, the next business day, Target and like all these other department stores, they probably called the meeting like, are, are we doing something like that? <laughs> we need something like that. If they're doing it, we need something like that. That, right. that was probably happening in a lot of places. Yeah. And that's and so, yes, not the same thing as Apple, but to Darren's point, definitely influence it influences what how people pay attention to the technology. So um, let's end there, because I, I know, Steve, that you um, you want this to go longer so that Deanne can yell at me. But <laughs> we're already at 50 minutes. So <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm we going missed to our mark. <laughs> so, yeah, we did. Thanks, Steve. Um, so yeah, so this has been speaking from user experience. Um, I will say that if you want to to learn more about augmented reality and virtual reality, we have a series that we've done called Reality Recap, where we talk about some of what's happening in the industry. We also have um, information and blog posts that we write on on our, on our blog, crosscom.com. That's crosscom with two M's. Um, but this is speaking from user experience, and um, we are signing off. Steve, we wish you well. We know you're going to do amazing things and it's been a pleasure doing this with you thank you i appreciate it i'm gonna miss these uh podcasts it's been a lot of fun yes i don't have uh, anyone to disagree with anymore and, and it's funny uh like you said uh, uh philippe that you kept gaining friends in vr and it's funny this week i've been doing nothing but losing friends because steve beat me at a uh, walkabout mini golf and he had to get deleted from my account so oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was gonna say too like it's good that when you have more and more friends joining me because then they can console you after I destroy you. With golf. <laughs> well, the funny thing is I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not adding friends. I'm just seeing that they now have Oculuses too. I'm getting the friend <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want I don't want people like I you know I don't want people trying to friend me after this. It's not, it's not what I do. <laughs> <laughs> One point right, two million new friend requests. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. This has been speaking from user experience. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>